this is our second from the end presentation in this camp meeting fifth presentation that I'm doing and we've been studying the subject of hermeneutics or the methodology in understanding how to interpret what we read we have discussed at some length the reason why we need methodology and as I've tried to point out the big problem that we have is our inability to properly understand and interpret what Ellen White means when she says whatever she is speaking about on a particular subject. The problems that confront us when dealing with Ellen White's words is that on any particular subject it's not as straightforward as we might think to mm -hmm. understand how we should comprehend what Ellen White is saying. Often it seems very simplistic because she speaks in such plain and simple language but on closer investigation what we find is that the more words Ellen White speaks about on a particular subject often the more complicated and difficult it becomes and the reason for that I've tried to explain particularly when we address point two we are confronted with a problem either we have very little information on a particular subject or we have too much information on a subject and when we have too much information on a particular subject as we do on many controversial and important subjects that affect us as God's people we can fall into the trap into the problem that we're confronted when we deal with these uh, issues these subjects and I have spoken about them at length uh, synecdoche and a metonymy I've explained what they are and I've explained what the problem is and the difficulty that we face is that we tend to want to gravitate to this point here that a part always refers to the whole but what I've tried to show us is that when it comes to Alan White's writing a part does not equal the whole especially when you have a large amount of information on a particular subject and it can be any subject um, for instance the nature of man the human nature of Christ the nature of the Holy Spirit subjects such as those nature of man, the nature of Christ, the nature of the Holy Spirit Ellen White speaks um, volumes on those subjects and because she speaks so much about them what people struggle to do is take all of her statements on a particular subject and condense them into a simple to understand and a simple to explain 
answer. And what tends to happen is a particular thought leader, a teacher, stands up, speaks with force, speaks with eloquency on a particular perspective of one of those subjects, as an example. And reading the Spirit of Prophecy gets gets enthralled by a particular perspective, makes it that person's niche uh, ministry or um, study or interest and then they begin to push this as the complete revelation on a particular subject and what tends to happen is people gravitate to that person's perspective and once that happens you fall into the um, trap as I've explained of the cult of personality and what people are unwilling to do then is to listen to alternative perspectives a subject that continually confronts Adventism is the nature and the personality of the Holy Spirit we know within our movement that we have been confronted with this doctrinal controversy as have many church members we seem to attract people who have a different view of um, a doctrinal subject which I will call the Godhead what does the Godhead look like Father Son Holy Spirit and we seem to attract people who have a differing view to us and the reason we attract those people is because they have a desire to study the spirit of prophecy and accept Ellen White's writings I'll say it this way at face value and they see us approaching her writings in a similar way just want to comment people are having problems with the audio today and the reason they're having problems is because we've had problems of the audio at our end and we've switched to a different microphone and that's why people are probably struggling with the audio today and that's why there was a delay we weren't able to fix the problem and um, just want to apologize for that so I'm hoping people can hear sufficiently well to understand what I'm saying so people will arrive and they will come across the spirit of prophecy quote think that they have discovered some new perspective some new light some new angle and they will promulgate that and then what tends to happen is when people resist that or argue against it that particular person becomes defensive and this is a common problem in Adventism that they take things personally and feel like the truth is being suppressed that it's um, this new light is being attacked and then it switches from a Bible study to really a conspiracy and from the conspiracy you develop a cult of personality and what happens is people who follow that line of thinking um, that particular person end up getting to a place where they're no they're no longer willing to even listen to reasoned arguments because they see whatever argument that attacks their cherished perspective as an attack upon the truth 
what we have experienced in the church for decades and decades over these issues is exactly what we are seeing in uh, the political world externally, particularly in the United States today. People develop conspiracy theories thinking that there is some hidden agenda that is designed to bring down and suppress the truth. And that is why with the subject of the Godhead and the personality and nature of the Holy Spirit, those people who believe that Jesus is the literal son of the literal father and that the Holy Spirit is a literal power force or an energy field of some kind of Jesus because they read those literal words it's very hard to persuade them that they're mistaken you can show them spirit of prophecy quotes to um, that contradicts and shows that their position is not right and what they will do is they will just run a, run circles and circles around this subject going nowhere and will never accept an alternative perspective and the reason why they're unwilling to do so is because of this issue here they believe a part of the information a part of the whole explains the whole and they're not willing to take an holistic view and realize that the part that they are dealing with does not reflect or represent the whole and what happens is when people try to give a perspective of the particular cherished quotes that they have that defend or bolster their position that Jesus is the Son, that the Holy Spirit is just a force, they're unwilling to take that perspective. They begin to dig their heels in. And this is an unfortunate, an, an unfortunate occurrence to happen, but it happens so often I think we don't really appreciate how serious this issue is and without following methodology properly you will be drawn into um, this web if you're not careful. If I can say in a really crass and worldly perspective there's a sucker born every day and unfortunately there are too many people in our movement who are being drawn in and sucked into false ideas because they're falling foul of this issue People want me to speak louder, and if you're in this room, you would know that I am at full volume. I want to read um, a, um, two Spirit of Prophecy passages to us. Unfortunately, I haven't been able to pass these passages on to the translators, so I'm going to give it to them now. And hopefully they'll have a couple of minutes to prepare themselves. Although I'm just thinking now, I don't think this will help. Because this is certainly from a passage that hasn't probably been translated into a foreign language, into another language. Let me see if I can find a different... No, this is from miscellaneous collections. So what I'll do is I'll still give the reference and I'm assuming that they may be able to use a DPL or another translator to translate this into their own language. It's PC. 
298. Paragraph 2 and 3. PC is the Paulson collection, a collection of letters that Ellen White wrote to a brother called Paulson and this particular section is dealing with Paul's experience. What Ellen White is going to do is compare the problems that confronted Paul with the problems that are confronting her or the church at this particular junction at this particular time period I'm just trying to see if I can give you the date for this this is 1909 quite late into Ellen White's ministry and it's it's, it's a letter that's written to the leading ministers in California so I've just set that up for people I'm going to switch topics for a few minutes to give people um, give the translators a moment to try to locate and to if possible translate that and I'll come back to that in a moment so talking about methodology I've given seven reasons why we need to be so focused on understanding what it is that we're reading. I've tried to labour on this issue of how easy it is to be drawn in by personalities and not to think for yourself. I've discussed William Miller's rules of prophetic interpretation we spent some time looking at rule 14 and I tried to show us the inconsistent position that people have when it comes to those with an empty mind and those with a free mind and how easy it is to manipulate the information to deceive people even if it's done unwittingly and switch people who are free thinkers and identify them as bigots and to identify bigots as those who are free thinkers and I'm hoping that each of us takes these things to heart and the reason why it's important and I spent time um, discussing that particular rule is because the current controversy we are in a shaking that's confronting this movement on multiple continents in fact the three geographical areas that we are having camp meetings in African continent uh, Oceania and uh, the Americas and those three continents I know the Americas are two continents I understand that and Africa also encompasses Europe in its time frame um, time zone sorry but in those areas this controversy is being waged is alive and well within our movement and every single one of us should be aware that there is a controversy going on even if we're not fully au fait with the details of that controversy or if we're not familiar with the the names of the people or the personalities that are involved in this controversy I want us all to be aware that the controversy is here Almost a month ago now, on the 19th of August, a two-part presentation was recorded in Australia by Elder Tess. And as she and I have discussed the matter, 
we are alarmed by the fact that so few people in our movement have actually watched those presentations. And the reason why we have such a concern with respect to those, uh, that particular study is the following. In the history of this movement, there have been punctuated points in our history where God has delivered a message that has been extremely relevant and important for that time period. Um, in the words of a famous um, person, the times have found us. And from our perspective, that particular study on the 19th of August fits into that category. It's one of the most important studies that have been given to this movement since the Midnight Cry message of 2018. If I were to highlight important points in our history, it would be October, September 2018, the Midnight Cry message. It would be August 2019, the international camp meeting in Germany. And August 2020, the 19th of August, where this presentation was given. And the reason why this presentation is of such significance is because it explains succinctly, simply and accurately where we are in our reform line with respect to what's happening in the dispensation of Jacob's time of trouble. We have gone through a four step controversy and we are currently at the fourth step. And these four steps that we have gone through are the same four steps that Elder Jeff and his followers, we can just use the, um, the symbol or as we wrote here, um, the representative word uh, phrase Future for America to represent that whole group of people that Future for America went through as they separated from our movement. And we have arrived at the fourth and last step. The fourth and last step is the one where those people who are in a controversy, theological controversy, in our movement become visible. They become vocal. The personality is now seen. And this is the same point that we arrived at last year in August when Elder Jeff became the cult of personality that people gravitated around because they were enamoured, excited, um, enthralled by him as a person. Even though they didn't fully understand the message that he was given. We've arrived at the same place today and in that controversy there was a struggle over leadership over organization and we have arrived at the same point today there is a struggle within our movement over the subject of organization or leadership and the controversy is over the subject of the Midnight Cry message 
which I want to say in a very simple way is equality and nationalism. Those are the theological issues that produce a struggle over organisation and who will lead the movement going forward. And we have now arrived at a stage, a time in our history, where it is now an open warfare. You can identify the names of the people that are now fighting openly against the truth of the midnight cry message, which is the subject of nationalism and equality. And as I say, even though the controversy may look slightly different, even though the issue may appear to be something unique over those three geographical areas that I've spoken about, we are saying that it has a common thread all the way through. And the common thread is nationalism and equality. Sometimes one, sometimes the other, but often combined into a toxic mix. And what this controversy, this theological controversy, creates is a challenge of organisation and leadership. And what happens in that context, in that environment, is that personalities are raised up and identified. And that's what we are now confronted with at stage four. I cannot urge you strongly enough to watch those presentations. It's a matter of grave concern to us that as far as we're aware, those present that presentation, and I say those because it was two parts, that presentation has not been translated into every single major language that we have in our movement. We have major languages and we have some minor ones. A minor language does not mean an unimportant um, language. Every ministry should have recognised the importance of those presentations. Every leader in every ministry should have already watched them and they should have taken it upon themselves to have those presenta that presentation translated. People are asking on the chat what presentation I'm referring to and there are people who are responding by sending those links um, for that two-part presentation. It's not sufficient to just watch them, it's more that we need to reiterate those presentations, we need to share them and they need to be translated into every language so that each of us has a clear understanding of what is happening. Part of the problem that is confronting this movement, and I want to say this in a respectful fashion, particularly on the African continent, is that there are people in our movement who don't know English. And then therefore, they become dependent upon people in the movement, who obviously can speak English, to share the present truth cutting edge messages with them and unfortunately what we are observing particularly in East Africa in the countries that comprise East Africa that people are taking this problem and using it to their advantage those people who do not have ready access to presentations either because they don't have internet access or they don't understand English are being deprived of understanding 
what the movement is going through at this present time. And people are using these things to their advantage. We have credible information, first-hand testimony, that people are using, particularly my name, to defend their convoluted and erroneous positions on both nationalism and equality. Yesterday, we went through a question and answer session and I didn't read all the questions, I didn't answer them all, um, not because I was avoiding, but because we ran out of time. But there were some questions that I didn't get an opportunity to answer, which touched on this very issue. And the issue is this, people struggle with my presentations and the reason they struggle with my presentations is because of the openness and frankness with which I speak. A common reference point that people go to and people are going to on this issue is the presentations that were done in Portugal and what I want to say to people is the following I want to reread the statement that I shared with um, uh, with the group um, on these presentations at my very first presentation superficiality is the bane of scholarship truth has nothing to fear from thorough investigation. It thrives on scrutiny. Its very nature courts the light. And when I present, particularly on the messages both in Portugal and earlier in the year in Uganda, I dealt with controversial subjects in an open and frank manner. And every time I have ever done that in the past, it's given an opportunity to those people who have wanted to take that opportunity to twist my words and use it to their own advantage. Whether they do that maliciously or deliberately, I cannot answer because I don't know what's in their heart, but I see the fruit of what is happening. So, for those people, particularly in East Africa, if you are being taught by people, by teachers in this movement, and they are using my name to defend their new view of something, then you should be on guard. And unfortunately, what my fear is, that the very people that I need to speak to in this presentation don't even understand English and will probably not have access to this internet uh, presentation because no one's going to provide them um, with this resource unless special measures are taken. The reason why this is so dangerous, so complicated, so difficult is because it's so easy to take people's words and misconstrue them and misunderstand them. A few weeks ago, Elder Tess made a statement in one of her presentations and she said in no uncertain terms that we today should not be turning to Adventist theologians, Adventist ministers, Adventist thought leaders to gain truth or to gain an understanding of the truth here at the end of the world. 
they have nothing to offer us that we cannot discover for ourselves or that we already know. She gave a beautifully simplistic example of this. You and I could never imagine that after Paul's conversion, when he returns to Jerusalem and seeks out Caiaphas, Annas and other members of the Sanhedrin to try to show them the mistake that they have made now that he has seen the light he didn't go and ask them what their opinion was what their thoughts were he didn't go and sit at the feet of Gamaliel he went there to instruct them you can take that principle and think about any of those apostles. When Peter and John, in Acts chapter 2 and 3, at the gate beautiful, they're not going to the, to the temple to, to glean light from the rabbis, from the priest. They're going there to instruct them into the ways of salvation. And in the same way, the Millerites did not go to the theologians of Protestantism and seek for wisdom and counsel from them. Rather, they debated and fought against them, sometimes privately, sometimes publicly. Why today have we come to a place where people in our movement think that there is light to be gleaned from people outside of this movement. I'm hoping I've given enough time for people to locate that reference. So I'm now going to read it, if that's okay. So I'm reading from the Paulson Collection, page 298, paragraph 2. I think this was uh, written in, I think I said 1909. It's a letter to the leaders in California. And Ellen White's going to speak about problems that she is confronted with. one moment as is usual I'm going to cause you some problems because I want to read another paragraph as an introductory thought and I want to apologize to my translators for adding this in at the last moment I've given page 298 it's a fair way down through this article and I want to go to the very beginning of this article. It's called Paul's Experience, I've already mentioned, and I want to go to um, the first and second paragraph. This is page 279. Paragraph 1 and 2. Almost 20 pages before. This is the introductory thought. We, um, if the translators can just paraphrase, that would be good. Um, the main point I wanted us to read is uh, the passage that I gave. We would do well to study carefully the first and second chapters of first corinthians so ellen white's going to speak about corinthians first corinthians chapters one and two she then quotes we preach christ crucified the apostle declared and christ crucified is this she's going to explain what christ crucified means to certain people 
unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. But to them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. So, Paul's message is Christ crucified. The death and resurrection of Christ. This subject to the theologians of Adventism is a stumbling block. This subject to the Greeks or to the world is foolishness. So I want us to see that whatever doctrine the Church of Ephesus is grappling with is going to be rejected both by the church because it's a stumbling block and both by the world because it's foolish. They both reject but for different reasons. Read also the third chapter of this book, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and study and pray over these words. As the people of our faith and practice need to be energised by the Holy Spirit. No ruling power that would compel men to obey the dictates of the finite mind should be exercised. Cease ye from man whose breath is in his nostrils, the Lord commands, by turning the minds of men to lean on human wisdom, we place a veil between God and man, so that there is not a seeing of him who is invisible. Now, a passage like this is often used to attack this movement, is going to be used to attack those people who I'm saying are the free thinkers who follow verbatim to the very letter the midnight cry message and people will argue that what these people are doing is following as in the passage says following man and what that means is following a, a human being in this particular context with respect to the midnight cry Elder Tess and they see following Elder Tess and the midnight cry message that she gave is not free thinking but is just following a human being with uh, faults and failings this is how the argument is used over and over again this is not a new argument this is an argument that has been running not only through this movement but through Adventism since its inception. We shouldn't be surprised because this is the very argument that Paul is having to grapple and deal with. Who do you listen to? Do you listen to a human being, a personality, a cult of personality, or do you listen to God's word, which I want to say is hermeneutics. Not only reading, but understanding what you read. I'm sure you all realise, at least I hope you all realise, the difficulty that Paul and God find themselves in. Thank you. The difficulty that they find themselves in is that God is not going to give a dream, a vision to his people one night and show them the truth about how to read the Old Testament that explains the death and resurrection and ministry of Christ. It won't be that way. He will raise up a human agent to be his voice piece which he has done at every time a gathering occurs.
And therefore, when Paul uses these arguments about who we should follow, about ceasing from following human beings, the argument that can be levelled against him is that whilst he says don't follow humans, he means those humans, he, he in essence says rather than following them, follow me. I'm sure we can all see the dichotomy in that statement. Just trying to find a Bible passage if I can. Find the passage in our next presentation. Um, I want to read um, the two passages um, that I've given to you and as I said, I've taken us to the introductory thought about do you follow what I want to call methodology or do you follow human wisdom? And the problem is there are two human beings that are being that you're going to have to decide to listen to. The man, as it says, see she from man whose breath is in his, in his nostrils or are you going to follow Paul as he explains how to interpret and understand the prophecies that deal with Christ. Remember, unto the Jews this information is a stumbling block and unto the Greeks it's complete foolishness. Quoting As the Lord has wrought in a remarkable manner to uphold the messages sent to correct the strange work that was being done the evil has been checked but it has but it has not yet been fully rooted out and if there were not a continuation of the messages from the lord to his people the will and ways of men would yet prevail to bring in strife and contention and the deformed work would be the result. I'm just going to paraphrase all of that. So Ellen White talking to these brethren in California has said that in dealing with this controversy she could see that the Lord had done a remarkable work. And what he had done is, as it says, the Lord had wrought in a remarkable manner to uphold the messages sent to correct the strange work that was being done. There was a strange work that was being done in California. There is a strange work that's being done in East Africa. And that strange work was addressed by messages that the Lord had sent and these messages were given to God's people in a remarkable manner she says the evil has been checked but it had not yet been completely rooted out so even though it had been hindered this evil work this strange work that was going on, that evil had not been yet rooted out. And what needed to happen was that there had to be a continuation of the messages from the Lord to his people. 
in order to continue placing a check on this evil and to hopefully root this evil out. And if there was a, a withdrawing or a slackening of this rebuffing or this message to confront this evil, what would happen would be that the ways of men would yet prevail. So those opponents to the truth would win the day unless God, with the message that he had given to Ellen White, was continually, continually pressed upon the hearts and minds of the people. What would happen is if they stopped, then the ways of men would win and they would continue to bring in strife and contention and the work would be deformed. Continuing, quote, I was shown that human power is constantly working to weave itself into the work of God. This brings in disjointed and inharmonious action. The messages of pure and unadulterated truth are in danger of being trampled under feet by self-willed, unconverted men, and I'm going to add women, who work to destroy confidence in the warnings that God would speak to the hearts of his people to correct error and to encourage righteousness. What has happened is that these people are bringing in disjointed and inharmonious actions into the work of God because they have a false message. And with this false message, what will happen is the true unadulterated message, the midnight cry message in our context, is in danger of being trampled under the feet of these people who are weaving into the work of God their own selfish, ambitious thoughts and ideas. She calls these people unconverted. And unconverted means that they have not accepted the present truth message of that dispensation. And in our history, in our dispensation, we have people in the context of this particular point that I want to make, because it's a real issue in East Africa currently, there are unconverted men who are being raised up and they're trampling down the pure unadulterated truth of the midnight cry message. And you can be certain that they are not using open and clear discussions or methodology to do that work. What they're doing is destroying confidence in the warnings that God would speak to the hearts of his people to correct error and to encourage righteousness. What is the error that we have been taught in this movement for the past two years? Nationalism and equality. We know that's the error that has been, uh, God has tried to correct. And what will happen is the truths that have been introduced by these unconverted people within our movement is that they will trample down upon these truths and they will destroy confidence in these uh, issues of nationalism and equality. Now, I want to add a point. When we speak about equality, sometimes we think about it as a separate point and sometimes we springboard from equality to a, another um, connected subject and that is organisation and so organisation and equality are under threat not only on the African continent but in other parts of the world and I want us to be clear that that attack is being done and is now in the open 
because we can see the personalities who are doing this work. Second paragraph. A great many of the difficulties that have come to our work in California and elsewhere have come in through a misunderstanding on the part of men in official positions concerning their individual responsibility in the matter of controlling and ruling their fellow labourers. There are people in our movement in positions of responsibility who are essentially abusing that position of responsibility and taking advantage of the flock under their care. They're using that authority that they have been given to promulgate these new truths that they claim are so important to be understood by members of the movement today. Men entrusted with responsibilities have supposed that their official position embraced very much more than was ever thought of by those who placed them in office and serious difficulties arose as the result. Just want to uh, do one sentence on the next paragraph. Simple organisation and church order are set forth in the New Testament scriptures and the Lord has ordained these for the unity and perfection of the church. What I want us to see and understand is that these truths that are being promulgated which people are claiming to be new great light that this movement needs that is an adjunct or an or additional light that uh, we need and without which we cannot finish and complete our work really is a challenge on equality and leadership or organization so we run out of time and uh, it's a convenient place to pause I just want to summarise what we have discussed uh, in today's presentation. We've been looking at the subject of methodology, specifically hermeneutics. Hermeneutics is the science and the art of not reading, but it's the science and art of understanding what we read. And what happens far too often is that people fall foul on this second point. They think that a part of a subject is the same as the whole of the subject. And what people have done in the past, in the present, and I suspect they will continue to do in the future, is they cherry pick, they take certain portions of a particular subject and they believe that that portion or part represents the whole of the subject and it becomes so important to them this particularly this particular perspective that they have that they are unwilling to see or understand or have a rounded view on this subject to be balanced they begin to see that anybody who argues with them is really challenging God's will. And what quickly develops is that these people end up identifying themselves as the champions of the oppressed or the champions of the trodden um, minority, uh, the trodden um, members of a movement or the people that they are being abused or even suckered by the establishment, the leadership of the movement. And this is the very scenario that we are now confronting, not only in Africa, but in many other parts of the world. People are raising up and identifying themselves as the champions of liberty, the champions of freedom against the establishment and the establishment 
is El Vites, myself, and the continental leaders, the structure that the Lord has put into place. And the reason why they have got to this place, which is why it's so important to watch that presentation that I've referred to, Fourth Freedom, that Elder tested on the 19th of August, is because when they go through these steps, what the underlying problem is that not only do they just misread passages, but they selectively read passages. And they, by not following simple principles of hermeneutics, they end up having erroneous positions of what is truth. They make mistakes. And because they see themselves as a champion, they're not willing to listen to other people, particularly Elder Tess and myself, as we would begin to reason with them to show them why they're making their mistakes. They would see this as a continuation of the status quo or the establishment, trying to just squash their revival message. This all sounds ugly because it is ugly. Ellen White calls this an evil work that needs to be checked and it's very difficult to root out. The only way that this can be rooted out is by individuals not accepting these erroneous truths without careful scrutiny, without careful investigation and to be awake to the techniques that people use. I've explained one of them. People use my name and say that they are presenting a message in agreement with what I have taught as though they and I are in agreement and I want every one of us to know that I'm not in agreement with the truths that these people teach. And what happens is that you end up challenging the very thing that you claim to be defending, which is equality, organization, and um, we'll call it nationalism, or I'll just call it nationalism. In order to make the claim of defending those things, they actually end up attacking them surreptitiously. And the track of error lies so close to the track of truth, it's very difficult to discern what's happening. And the places that are in the most danger are those countries, those localities that don't have access, ready access, to the information that Elder Tess and myself are presenting, where they become um, dependent on people translating our studies, or they become dependent on people sharing the messages because they don't have internet access. A lack of understanding English and uh, poverty are the things that people are taking advantage of in order to promulgate these new supposedly true called truths that they have. But in essence what's happening is that there is an attack upon the pure unadulterated truth of the midnight cry message. Can't speak in more emphatically than that. This is not a new phenomena. This is something that has happened over and over again. We've gone way over time. I apologise. Uh, we have one more presentation in the Q&A this afternoon. And I'm hoping that each of us can um, uh, join us this afternoon as we come back together again. Let's close with prayer.
Heavenly Father, we want to give you praise and thanks for your goodness and mercy. We pray that you would guide, direct and bless us in the study and meditation of your word. Father, as we realise there's another shaking is not only in progress, it is coming to its crescendo, to its final moment. Already personalities are making themselves visible. Already they are openly challenging and attacking the midnight cry message. They use various means to do this evil work, as Alan White will call it. We know that it's a direct challenge to the work of organisation, that you have instructed your people to begin. It's a direct attack on equality and as people see the fruit of that evil work, they see how equality is being undermined at every level. It's my hope and my prayer that each of us listening to this presentation and even those who are not, if they could be, if these thoughts could be shared with them, that we might come onto the right side of this issue, that we might contemplate the significance of William Miller's 14th rule, that we would have free minds and step on the side of truth and not have an empty mind and listen to erroneous, false and evil messages. May this be our prayer and this is my hope in Jesus' name. Amen.